Sunday is for me almost without exception an exciting day. I look forward probably to Sundays and Thursdays more than any days of the week and I'm pretty excited about most days of the week. And I seldom play golf on either Sunday or Thursday. That's just for those of you that think, oh yeah, he's excited about Thursday because that's when he plays golf. I play golf on Wednesdays if I can. When Carl called me last night to tell me about his mother, he said, pal, I'm going to interrupt your golf day because the service is 10 o'clock in Visalia on Wednesday morning. That's all right. That is interruptible, my friend. Any time that I can be of assistance to people, golf does get interrupted. But I'm excited about the opportunity. Thursday, because of my men's Bible study, 6 o'clock, some of you men need to be there. You've never made it yet. You've talked about it. You've thought about it. You've said, yes, I'm going to be there, and you haven't made it yet. But at 6 o'clock, we're in the chapel. It's a wonderful time. At 10 o'clock that morning in the same chapel, I meet in a women's Bible study. And those are great, exciting days. But there's an unusual thing about the first Sunday of the fall season. That's today. There's something unusual about the choir coming back. I've missed them all summer. And when they are coming back, and then when the new classes are starting, and, and the whole staff is full of expectation, great things are going to happen. We are charged up. And I always wrestle my way through, what do I preach on opening day? This is kind of like opening day of the baseball season. I've had the privilege to be at Candlestick on opening day. It's unusual. People that seldom go to a ball game go on opening day. People that don't care about baseball go on opening day. People that are just there because there's a crowd there go on opening day. And I always feel that there are some folks that somehow they get the message, it's going to be a big extra special show. Better sneak on down and take a look and see what it's like on opening day. And I wrestle with that as I think about what to preach. And then I think about you. It's an interesting spot to be here week after week. Never gets humdrum. Never gets to where there is no excitement in it for me. Never gets to where I'll just go in there and just knock something out and, and that's easy to do. If you've been doing that for 40 years and you can't do it yet, you're in big trouble. But if there's no excitement in what you do, when you're handling the word of God, you're in even bigger trouble. And that excitement is there. And as I think about you and think about so many situations in which I see you, some in the midst of some kind of family difficulty, either you have been going through a divorce this summer or you're about to start into one and whether you're one of those divorcing partners or whether you're the child of a divorcing partner and, and you're thinking, what's going to happen to me? I don't know what the future holds. Perhaps things have turned bad for you in business and you've had to swallow a lot of pride as you've had to acknowledge going through bankruptcy, finding that that ability to provide for your family, even though the ability is still there, the wherewithal is not there. And you've got to start over. And even though we thank God for health and for strength to be able to start over, that's a tough thing on us to have to start over. Perhaps this is a summer where you've had to face the pronouncement of some physician that you have an illness that is going to devastate your body or one of your loved ones has that and you've gone through the struggle of all of that. Perhaps your struggle is primarily spiritual. You don't know really where you are with the Lord or you know where you are and it's nowhere and you struggle with the courage to face that. Perhaps this has been a summer where a door of opportunity that you felt was wide open to you for years has been closed tight and you've got to rebuild out of that kind of disappointment. I don't know where you are in all of that. That business of not being sure of what's ahead. But I want to say this, whatever your problem, it can become a doorway to a new and deeper walk with God if you'll begin to look in that direction for the help that you need right now. I want you to go with me to Isaiah chapter 6 because Isaiah 
presents an unusual picture for us here in the sixth chapter. He starts out by saying, in the year King Uzziah died. That was a very significant year. Uzziah was 16 years old. You'll find this in 2 Chronicles. 16 years old when he was anointed to be king over, over Israel. He was generally a very good king. He understood his responsibilities. He led his people in proper paths. And then he began to have one success after another. And at a certain point, he did that thing that so often we do when success comes our way. He took everything into his own hands. He decided that he could do anything. He had been so successful and he became foolish and he went into the temple and began to function like a priest. It was not his role. It was not his responsibility. In fact, he was violating the order of God to go and do that. And the priest ran after him and said, you can't do that. And he said, I'm king. Get out of my way. I'll do what I want. And as he held one of those censers and lit that fire, they saw immediately that leprosy came upon his body. And lepers in those days were separated from the general public. And here was the king separated. He ruled through one of his sons until the day of his death. And it was a sad day in the land of Israel when King Uzziah died. And he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the temple was filled with his glory. Hovering about him were mighty six-winged angels of fire. With two of their wings they covered their faces. With two others they covered their feet. And with two they flew. In a great antiphonal chorus they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Such singing it was, it shook the temple to its foundations. And suddenly the entire sanctuary was filled with smoke. Now, I'm going to tell you, friend, this kind of an experience would cause you some kind of consternation. To see the Lord, to comprehend him in a way that you had never known before. I have no idea of Isaiah's background. It may have been kind of a mental thing where he kind of had a picture of the Lord. See, a part of the struggle of a pastor is to open the word to people that come from all kinds of backgrounds. Some of you know so little about the Bible that it's just unmentionable. Some of you have learned great things from the time you were a kid. Your mom and your dad took time to read the word to you. They sang hymns to you. You enjoy great music. You find yourself in a place when you come to this kind of a service, it lifts you up partly because it carries you right back in your memory to that time of the things you were taught when you were little. But it would be interesting to know where have you gotten your information concerning the Lord? What are you doing with that information? You see this, the ultimate experience in life is to know God. If you ever get that straight and say, I am going to subscribe to that, that the ultimate experience in life is to know God. I will let nothing stand in my way of knowing him. I will pursue the course of excellence to know the Lord. I will move in this direction. I will let nothing stop me. I had Mitch read for you out of Philippians chapter 3. Let me reread just a part of that. All the things I thought were once worthwhile, now I've thrown them all away so that I can put my trust and my hope in Christ alone. Yes, Everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have put aside all else, counted it worth less than nothing in order that I can have Christ and become one with him. No longer counting on being saved by being good enough or by obeying God's laws, but by trusting Christ to save me. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith, counting on Christ alone. The literal translation of that is not it's worth less than nothing. You have to talk nice when you open the Bible, see? 
He said, it's, it's, it's a pile of dung. It's a pile of horse manure. That's what he says. Everything else is just horse manure alongside of knowing Christ. Now, somebody out there saying, my, he shouldn't say things like that in the pulpit. That's what it says. We find it very difficult to really believe what the scriptures say and put things in their proper order with a proper label on them. Yet God would wake us up with strong language if we would only listen. The apostle Paul came to the place of saying, the most important thing in my life is to know God and to do his will. Isaiah saw God in his holiness and in his righteousness. The scripture tells us, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. You hear that? Without holiness, none of us will see the Lord. And we can say, God, we're whipped. There's no way. We do not have that holiness. That's why we need Jesus Christ. Thank God he came, went to the cross, offered himself for us, and bestows on us his holiness when we receive him as our savior. Remember this, you will never understand the Bible until you accept the fact that God is holy, God is righteous, God is pure. You will never, you will always find yourself trying to whittle God down to human size. You'll find yourself saying things that you'll, you'll hear somebody say this at, at some place. It may be at work. It may be at a golf game. It may be at a cocktail party. You'll hear somebody say, I just can't believe that a God of love would send anyone to hell. That's right. Until you understand his holiness and understand his righteousness and understand his purity, you will never understand that. And when you come to the place where you finally decide that you will believe that those are the basics that we must get hold of, then you'll begin to understand the scriptures. And until then, you'll always be confused. He demands this holiness and this righteousness from us, and then he gives it to us in the person of Jesus Christ when we accept him as our savior. I don't understand that. Do you hear me? I do not understand that. I just know it's true. And knowing that it's true puts the demand on me to preach it and preach it and preach it because that will not change. It has not changed. It never will change. That comprehension of who God is will change your whole life once you'll take that step toward him. And you see what it did to Isaiah. It brought him to a place of great conviction. He said, verse five, my doom is sealed for I am a foul mouthed sinner, a member of a sinful foul mouthed race. And I have looked upon the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. I'm done. He saw his own sinfulness. One of the toughest things about preaching in this day and age is that people do not want to deal with their own sinfulness. Bill Hybels, who pastors Willow Creek Church out in Illinois and one of the great booming young pastors in America, he preached a sermon recently. I saw a part of the text of it. He preached about a bumper sticker that he saw on the back of a car. You may have seen this. I've seen this bumper sticker, but I never put it into a sermon before. A bumper sticker that said, screw guilt. We live in an age where people don't want to say, well, I've got the guilties. People want to just say, screw guilt. I don't want anything to do with it. There's no sense. Let it go. There's no such thing as living under the pressure of guilt. And in our attempt to sidestep everything that God says, we whittle him down to human size. We choose to ignore guilt. We choose to build up a callus against it. 
Rather than understand that step one in coming into a strong and beautiful and fulfilling relationship with God is to see him in his majesty, in his righteousness, in his holiness, and in his purity and allow that conviction to overtake us. In, in Luke chapter five, Simon Peter was in a situation prior to coming to Jesus. Jesus knew how to hook him. Jesus was there and he said, hey, put me in your boat and push me out a little bit because I want to talk to these people. And Jesus was smart enough to know that if he was sitting out in the boat, his voice would hit on the water and bounce and would amplify tremendously. And when he finished the sermon, he turned to Simon, who was a professional fisherman, and said to him, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets and you'll catch a lot of fish. And Simon said, sir, we worked all night and didn't catch a thing. Always some guy trying to tell you how to do your job. Here's some itinerant preacher coming by telling me where to put down my net <clears throat> and tell me what I'll catch. But he said, uh, if you say so, we'll try again. And he went out, let those nets down. They were so full, they began to tear. And they shouted for help and brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and were on the verge of sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, sir, please leave us. I am too much of a sinner for you to have around. Have you ever had the courage to allow the conviction of God to wash over you to where you see yourself as a sinner and as such separated from God and have no opportunity for his holiness to rub off on you. See, Satan would say you're too bad. Satan would put words like this in your mouth, just go away because I'm too bad. There's no hope for me. That's the devil's lie. There's hope for every individual that will open himself and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I just pray that you allow the overwhelming sense of the holiness and righteousness of God to get hold of you. It's so easy to become like the world. It's so easy. I hear it with Christian people all the time in just casual conversation. Well, by God this and God this and God that. I think, what, 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 what is it with these people? They talk about worshiping this God. They talk about loving this God. And they throw his name around like it's nothing. We constantly do things that expose the fact that we don't hold God in high enough esteem. I was playing golf recently with a pastor. I don't do that very often. I'd rather play with other guys. Seems like it's more fun somehow. But I was playing golf with this pastor and he made a great shot. And he got back in the cart and he said, isn't God good? And I looked at him, somehow that all rubs me the wrong way. I looked at him and I said, I'm going to tell you something. God doesn't give a damn about your golf game. <laughs> you see, when you get in that attitude that God's really concerned about whether or not you're going to make a putt. I had a, I had a friend say to me the other day, he'd run into an acquaintance of mine from the country club. And the guy said, oh yeah, he knows you. He saw, sees you pray over your putts all the time. And he said, I knew right away the guy didn't know you well at all. He probably never played one round of golf with you. See, I know God doesn't care about my golf game. He cares about my behavior. But he does not care about my score. He doesn't care about whether I win or lose. He cares about my behavior in the midst of that and I am not about to whittle it down and give God all kinds of praise and thanks for great shots. I always ask the question when some guy says, well, God was really with you on that shot. Where was he on the last one when I went out of bounds on the river? <laughs> you know, if we're gonna play this game, I wanna play it all the way. I wanna come to better understanding of what that's all about. People, we need to see the Lord high and lifted up, holy righteous, pure, and when we as God's people will begin to see him that way, it'll make a difference in our behavior. Immediately the confession, I'm a foul-mouthed sinner. I'm a member of a sinful, foul-mouthed race. You see, first of all, he made that personal. We like to do corporate judgment. Well, we're all kind of sinful and foul-mouthed, aren't we? Uh -uh. He said, I am. And then he put the group into it. I've looked upon the king the Lord of heaven's armies. And following his confession, 
Notice his cleansing. Then one of the mighty angels flew over to the altar and with a pair of tongs picked out a burning coal and he touched my lips with it and said, now you are pronounced not guilty because this coal has touched your lips. Your sins are all forgiven. Looking 800 years ahead to the coming of Jesus when he would go to the cross and through his death, he would forgive us all of our sins. Pronounce us not guilty. Isn't that a marvelous phrase? To pronounce us who are as guilty as we can be. To pronounce us not guilty. Only God has that right. Only God has that privilege. Only God has that power to pronounce us and make it stick that we are not guilty before him. And he alone is the one who counts. You see, one day, there is coming a day, in Revelation chapter 21, there's coming a day of judgment where the Lamb's book of life will be opened. And if your name is not there, because you have not come to an understanding of Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, if you've not come to that, you will stand eternally separated from God. And if you see his holiness, and his righteousness and his purity, it will begin to affect how you live. God provides the answer and declares us not guilty. And out of that comes that great challenge. The Lord said, whom shall I send as a messenger to my people? Who will go? And Isaiah said, Lord, I'll go, send me. You see, the marvelous transformation from being one who says, my doom is sealed. I'm a sinful, foul-mouthed person, and I'm a part of a sinful, foul-mouthed race. And I've looked upon the king. My, instead of seeing that, you can find yourself saying, Lord, I'll go. Send me. As the choir was going down in the first service, I stopped Blair Looney. I said, who are you taking through Timothy? And he told me. I said, Blair, less than two years ago, you were lost. Absolutely lost in every area of your life. And you've come to Jesus Christ and you've known his cleansing. And you know his power in your life. And you've uniquely responded to that. But I encourage you with this. Don't ever be without a Timothy partner. For that'll keep you close to the word. It'll keep in focus the fact that you need to be involved in discipling others, in winning others to Jesus Christ through that. Don't ever lose it. Don't ever back up. Don't ever say, I need to take a break. Break time is when Satan will sweep in and shoot you down. Stay strong, stay steady and stay busy in the business of sharing the word of God with others. That same hope, that same prayer is what I have for you. That you'll see God as he is, that you'll see yourself as you are, not as you wish you were, but as you are, that you'll accept his cleansing, and then that you'll accept his challenge who will I send the challenge to say, I'll go, send me? Just two questions. Are you willing to finally acknowledge yourself for who you are and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Today should be the day of salvation for many of you listening to this message. Are you willing to say, I see God in his holiness, but I see he's got a plan for me where he will pronounce me not guilty. And secondly, many of you who have made this step and have trusted Jesus as your savior have not yet come to the place of giving him lordship over your life. 
your time, your money, and your energy, you still guard jealously and don't want God invading your areas of responsibility in any of those. Oh, I pray that today will be a day of moving in the right direction. Bow your heads with me. I want to pray with you. I really believe that there are many in this place this morning that might find themselves saying, Buf, I don't know Jesus Christ. I would like to, but I don't know him. But I would like this day, I would like this day to make a step of saying, I really want to know Jesus. I want to know him personally. I am willing to accept him today and fill out a card and let somebody sit with me this week and help point me to the Savior. I wonder how many across this building would say, Buf, pray for me. I need to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to accept him. I will fill out a card. I will sit with someone this week. Let me see your hand right now. Put it up. Just put it way up where I can see it. Make that move toward the Lord. Put it way up until I acknowledge it. God bless you. Thank you. Someone else, I need to know Jesus Christ. I know that I, 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 yes, God bless you back there. I need to know Jesus Christ. I'm not even sure that I'm saved at all, but I need to know him. Pray for me. Anybody else? I won't labor the point, friend. God bless you and God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hold it till I acknowledge your hand. I need to know Jesus Christ. Pray for me. Pray for me. Father, in this place, there are a number of people that have said, yes, I need to know Jesus. I ask you, Lord, to give them the courage to pull a card out of that rack right now while I'm praying. Reach up there and pull that card out so they can fill it out and put it in one of these mailboxes around the, the walls so that we can call them, make an appointment, and sit with them this week. So important that when the Spirit of God is working, we follow through and follow up and get the job done. Oh, I thank you for your blessing and for your power in this place. My prayer is for the believers in this place who are struggling with the Lordship of Christ, who struggle with the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the purity of God. Father, I pray that we would take our time to read Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 10 every day this week and in reading and in praying would open ourselves to see the value and the worth of setting things in proper order. Bless us as we go. Father, I pray that we would have hundreds and hundreds of people here tonight for the consecration service and for the communion time together. It's special, it's important. And so bring us back, I pray. Bless us as we go with your unique touch. And I'll thank you for it. In the name of the living Lord Jesus Christ, amen. I want to remind you, your assignment, Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Read it every day and consider how it ought to fit in your life and what you ought to be doing with the truth that is wrapped up in those passages to see whether or not that is true for you.